Right now, stop and frisk on trial. We're going to bring you live outside the courtroom for the very latest, including some shocking undercover video indicating minorities are, in fact, being singled out because of their color for stops. And next, we're going to talk about the grand old party and the challenges that lie ahead. How do they need to reboot to become the party of the future? And later, March Madness fully upon us. And let's be honest, everybody's got a bracket and billions being wagered on these games. But the players themselves don't see a penny. We'll talk about that. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French, and thanks for joining us this Friday. And it has been a long week, Friday evening, March 22nd. And let's start tonight with an issue we've covered for the better part of this week, and that is stop and frisk. You all know it's the controversial policing tactic employed by the NYPD, which allows officers to stop, question, and frisk people that they deem suspicious looking. Now, the policy, it is on trial right now in a Manhattan courtroom. For years, opponents of the practice, they claimed that it was applied on a race-based manner, especially because a huge majority of the people singled out for stops are, in fact, black and Hispanic. But yesterday, opponents of stop and frisk may have gotten their smoking gun. Now, during testimony, a damning recording was played for the courtroom, and in it, a police inspector, Christopher McCormick, he orders his subordinate to target young black men for street stops. Speaking to Officer Pedro Serrano, he said, quote, we go out there and we summons people, the right people at the right time, the right location. On the recording, you can then hear Officer Serrano press the inspector about who he means by the right people. Take a listen. This is about stopping the right people, the right place, the right location. Okay. Again, take my Haven where we had the most problems. Right. And most problems we had there was robberies and grand larcenies. And who the are those people was, robbing? The, rob the problem was what? Male blacks. And I told you they're all cool, and I have no problem telling you this. Male blacks, 14 to 20, 21. Now, the authority of the police to conduct street suites is not at issue in this case. But how they do it and whether or, not, whether or not race is a factor is most certainly at trial here. So the big question of what commanders mean by the right people is central to whatever the judge is going to come out of this for recommendations. And we'll also tell you in an election year what it's going to mean politically as well. Now, testimony it concluded today in the lower Manhattan courtroom. Dominic Carter, he was there and he joins us now with more. Dominic? Oh, we got a little problem with Dominic. Uh, do we reestablish audio with Dominic? Can we give that one more try? Okay, we're going to try and reestablish in a second. I'm going to bring in our panel on this. We'll bring Dominic back in a second. We got Bill O'Reilly with us, Newsday columnist, Republican consultant, not in that order. Evan Thies, he's the founder of the Brook of Brooklyn Strategies and a former aide to Hillary Clinton, as well as Andrew Cuomo. We'll bring Dominic back in, guys, but um, there's a political component to this. Forget about the right and the wrong, and we'll hear what happened in the courtroom. But we've heard, we've heard in the uh, repeatedly both last night at a Daily News uh, event that we brought uh, to everybody and then also on the actual campaign trail, mayoral candidates saying, kind of wanting it both ways a little bit, Evan, saying, you know what, I don't like the way it's done, but I want to preserve the practice to a certain degree. John right. Liu, in fact, he pressed this issue and Bill Thompson's like, well, I don't want to get rid of it altogether. Right. Can you survive in a Democratic primary by hedging your bets? You can. Uh, I think that it's helpful that um, this issue is out there and we're talking about it as a party uh, because the next mayor is obviously going to play a big role in figuring out what the policy is going to be going forward. Um, but look, everybody knows it's flawed. Everybody knows it's been abused and misused and that is the big problem here. It's not really about the practice. The practice is legal. It's constitutional when it's done correctly. Uh, but when the vast majority of stops are for furtive movements, which is a very objective yeah. measure, it, it really uh, stretches uh, credulity <laughs> to, to say whether or not those are stops that should be happening under our civil rights laws. In an election year, though, I just don't see how, and we've seen um, Christine Quinn um, try to split the baby on this and definitely yeah. taking it to the mayor. The mayor says, I don't care what the council says. If they actually pass something, I'm going to veto it. Christine Quinn saying, hey, I got the votes to override the mayor here. And by the way, I don't agree with him uh, that race is not a factor. Of course it is. Um, That's the first public spat between the two. Uh, 
I just don't know between now and Election Day, the more attention this gets, the more you hear recordings like that, if you can support it in any way, shape, or form and get elected, because you're already seeing the John Lewis of the world and yep. even some others hint, therefore a complete uh, overhaul of it, not on the margins, but on the main. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, this, this issue is going to run all the way up to the end of the primary. And, and uh, I mean, we're talking about a, like low turnout primaries, like mm -hmm. very, very low turnout. Yep. And someone's going to be all over this and they're not going to equivocate. I mean, I, I, people are going to be looking to peel away African-American vote. That's where these stop and frisks happen. Yep. And, um, and it's a visceral thing. Hey, I'm a middle-aged white guy, but, but this policy may work as a crime-fighting tool, but if it happened to me, I'd go nuts. Mm -hmm. I'd be furious oh, I about it. I talked about everybody. If it was my kid I'd and this happened, yeah. you know where I'd be. But I'd be it, at the precinct house yeah. and I have an yeah. attorney yeah. with yeah. me, That's too. Right. Yeah. But it, it, it may work, but it still it, it, it affects people. So I think I think a, a, a Democrat or all of them will very cleverly mm -hmm. jump on this issue and drive it all the and, way. And I'll tell you, I have two uh, clients who are running borough-wide in Brooklyn. Yep. You go into those central Brooklyn neighborhoods where there is a huge amount of these stop and frisks, and it is, other than the economy, the number one issue, yep. pretty much. Right. And everybody has an experience, either themselves or somebody they know. And it is embarrassing to people to get stopped and frisked. I mean, it is, it is not just, uh, they don't get used to it. And, in, in and, fact, if and I could, and I want to bring Dominic back in. We reestablished our live shot. And Dominic, first day of uh, testimony, we heard from three young guys, um, all three young black men, some students who just talked about getting off the subway, trying to go to their apartment, or somebody trying to go to the deli and going back to their apartment. And each of them talked about being stopped on multiple occasions. One guy even thought about being a cop later in life here, and now he went from being a defender of law enforcement to, as his words, looking at them as part of the problem. Uh, talk a little bit about what happened today. Well, Richard, you know, it's very interesting. I'm sitting here watching you guys discuss stop and frisk. And the same interest in which you guys are talking about it on the show is the same interest down here at the courthouse. Why do I say that? Well, in Judge Scheinland's courtroom today, a capacity crowd. You rarely see that in a courtroom, but so much so of a capacity crowd. Today, the judge had to have an overfill room. Now, over my shoulder, you may notice, Richard, there's a large crowd, and I'm going to talk about what you just mentioned, but there's a large crowd that has nothing to do with the case. They're filming a television show. All the real drama took place inside the judge's courtroom. Now, the three young men you mentioned that have testified that they were stopped and uh, under stop and frisk and felt that their rights were violated, as well as the police officers, the whistleblowers that testified in this case, of course, with their secret recordings to back up their allegations of what they were saying. Well, today, Richard, to answer your question, the city of New York, in defending itself, tried to get away from what those young men said and what those police officers have said uh, under oath and testimony. But, Richard, even that today may have backfired. So the city's latest effort to defend itself, it doesn't appear to be working as of today. Now, why do I say that exactly referring to today? Uh, one of the witnesses, Richard, that took the stand was a police officer. And this police officer sergeant, I'm going to give you a couple of things that he said. He was asked if he was ordered to increase the number of stop and frisk. No. Have you ever been denied overtime because of stop and frisk activity was too low? No. He went on to say racial, racial profiling is prohibited, Richard, but then he admitted that there is a performance goal. So he went almost against, now that part is not illegal, but it's close to being borderline. Now, most of the day consisted of mundane readback testimony in which one uh, was from Assistant Chief uh, Raymond Diaz, and in his readback read back testimony, he testified, even though he wasn't here today, Richard, that out of the 90% of the stops that were made, there was absolutely no criminal activity. Now, it was very interesting to actually see that. You know, we've reported it, you've reported it, Richard, but to actually see it under oath in a court of law and, and read back te uh, testimony was very interesting. So the judge, because of the uh, Jewish holiday coming up next week, there'll be no testimony until Wednesday, but the city has to find some way to defend itself because it's not doing a very good job as of now. Richard? Hey, Dominic, I want you to take a listen to this clip. I, I was talking to both uh, Bill and Evan about, uh, at that recent forum, uh, two guys that you know well, in fact, have spoke, spoken recently to both, um, John Liu and Bill Thompson. John Liu, um, he said to Bill Thompson, hey, join me for a complete end to stop and frisk. It got a little heated. Let's take a listen. 
Every time you talk about your 15-year-old, I feel terrible. I feel terrible that he has to live in a city like this, and a young man like your son would have to go through the potential of being stopped in prison and being instructed by his dad what to do if, you would have, if he has some kind of trouble. Bill, I want you to join me, because I feel lonely. I appreciate your comment. At the same point, no, I'm the one who has to worry about my son being stopped in prison. I'm the one who has to worry about my son being shot in the street of New York. I'm the one who has to worry, because when I grew up, it was a very different situation. I'm concerned about my son also being shot by somebody who's a member of a gang in the street. I'm worried about my son being mugged in the street of New York City. And at the same point, I don't have to sacrifice his constitutional rights to make sure he is safe. I don't have to sacrifice. I can have them both. So the truth is, you know something? You and I disagree on that. Fundamentally, we have a disagreement at the same point. We both want to see things used and done correctly in the city of New York. Hey, Don, let me ask you the same thing I asked uh, these guys. Can Thompson and others have it both ways on this, where they want to keep the practice but just change the way it's done, or by primary day, um, with, as these guys said, low turnout, you can have it both ways. Uh, are they going to all, by the end of the day here, have to say, get rid of the practice altogether? Well, you know, Richard, I, I, again, I'm standing here watching you guys in the studio, and it's like the Democrats are, are trying to outmaneuver each other. John Liu trying to go to the far left, trying to pull Bill Thompson along with him, knowing that Thompson's mouth-mannered, and he's not exactly the type that's going to do that. But yet, Thompson is the—it's all for a battle of the minority vote. By the end of the day, I do believe your uh, question, initial assessment, is correct that they're going to continue to say for a more restrictive policy on stop and frisk. And I, I think by the end of the day, I agree with your panelists that this issue is not going away and that they're going to be forced to move towards the position of John Liu. We're already seeing where Christine Quinn is under fire for Mayor Bloomberg and the unions uh, for even suggesting a monitor. So this is a hot potato. That's the best way to answer this, a political hot potato and the start of the mayor's race. This issue is not going away. All right, Dominic, good enough. Thank you very much. I'll see you back here in the studios on Monday.